Um, yeah, the Canary Girls. Uh, I wonder if anyone knows. Um, they were munition workers in both world wars, women mainly. But I got interested in the Canary Girls and found out about them because I, like a lot of people, thought everything came from China. But of course, before the world, First World War, nothing came from China, um, except perhaps the odd boat um, in Liverpool, actually, didn't they? Dot from China. Anyway, I digress as usual. So the First World War, what am I talking about? I can't remember now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've totally forgotten I've never done zoom before it's really very odd because I usually look at my audience and and get a feel for what I need to say anyway where was I oh yes the um, commemoration of the end of the first world war was the first time I heard about female munition workers and so I got interested from then on and we had a display at the church and there were some photographs and there were some wonderful photographs of young women who had signed on to make munitions. At this point, I had no idea just how big it was. Um, and I read a book by Kate Aidy, um, which talked about from corsets to camouflage. And one of the chapters in there was women come and work in the munition factories, get a yellow face and a square meal. So if we look at how how the uh, First World War came about, and I should be quick because I'm sure that you could debate the uh, origins of the First World War for the next millennium and not get to the end. You can see, I suppose you can see, because I don't actually know, the logo on the screen saying Canary Girls. And this logo was designed by my one of my grandchildren, my um, the next second granddaughter, bless her, cotton socks. Right. So we can go to the next slide, I think. Yes. So here we are before the outbreak of the First World War. Life in Britain, 1912, um, was well. It was one of the most restless decades in history. You probably all know about that. It was full of strikes and lots of unrest. This is a typical scene somewhere, probably in London, of people. And there was children worked, men worked, of course, but children worked and, and women and uh, also worked, but they were paid a pittance. Nothing, you know, we cannot understand what life was like for these people. Most of them lived in poverty and um, education was not something that was taken for granted. Um, the, there was a Factories Act, I think it was 1909 when it was brought up to, or 1906, when it was brought up to say that children under 11 couldn't work. <laughs> So if you're over 11, fine, you know, you can and there were all these rules. Anyway, let's move on. This is really weird for me. I'm sorry, folks, um, if I'm a bit disjointed. So 1912, also the Titanic sank, didn't it? And wages were going down and prices were rising and lots of people were rioting. And of course, the rise of the unions. Then put this into the mix, we get suffragettes. And their rallies, they're doing rallies all over the country and becoming more and more militant. And mainly they are upper class and middle class women who are running this. Um, but surprisingly, many, many working class women joined in suffragettes and joined and joined in the suffrage and, and got put to prison and got to, and they were actually treated far worse than your middle class or your upper class women. And to prove her point, a very, a very brave lady, Lady um, Linton, I can't quite remember her first name. She was the daughter of the, um, what's he called, the bloke, of the Viceroy of India. She was his daughter and she was arrested for throwing things and, and she got two days and then she was let go. When she bravely dressed up as a seamstress and was arrested, she got 14 days hard labour and full sped eight times. So there was a big difference between the upper classes and the lower classes. And it was absolutely rife in Edwardian Britain. And it's still it's still there to a degree. But anyway, we shall move to the next one. 
Right, so these young women here, they're working in domestic service. And for a woman, or a girl rather, in um, Edwardian Britain, the thing that you would aspire to would be to become a domestic servant because at least you've got a nice room and, a, and lots of food. You had to work very, very hard, but it was considered to be one of the best jobs a working class girl could get, rather than being a skivvy in the mills or in the laundries or in factories where men worked, women would normally do the sweeping up. They didn't get any real skilled work. Even in the mills, if a woman was skilled enough to be a weaver, she still only got half as much as the man for the same job. But if you'd like to look and see how young these women are, they're so very young. I don't suppose any of them are above 16. Then you can imagine that if they went out there and they saw the suffragettes and they're thinking to themselves, hang on, perhaps my life doesn't have to be like this. Perhaps I can have a say in how this country is governed. So you can see how they might be excited by that. So anyway, all this is going on and we're moving towards 1914. And let me see, what's the next one? Yes, that's the one. <laughs> I have to remind myself. So we can't see Kaiser Bill, but I'm sure you all know what he looks like. He was over there across the channel and he was building bigger and bigger battleships. He was building up his army. He was getting very happy with his sabre rattling and him and the Austro-Hungarian um, emperor, when, um, when uh, Franz Duke Ferdinand was shot, suddenly found the excuse they were looking for to go to war. But of course, Germany wanted France and there's a small problem there. You have to go across Belgium. And uh, we had a treaty with Belgium, so therefore that wasn't going to work very well, was it? So despite all the people working very hard to try and avert a war, a war happened. And there we have it. On August the 5th, 1914, war is declared. Now, the people in Britain had the empire backing them and they were feeling quite cosy about that generally. So war well that's all right we've fought plenty of them we we're usually victorious and so we won't worry too much about it and also the um the british had um a big navy britannia really did rule the waves at the time and all the munitions work and so forth were geared to looking after the navy um and the army itself although highly trained and, and very effective was mainly used to police the empire and all our outreaches there. So the next thing that I had to do, having declared war, because they only had a small standing army, was to get a bigger one. So here we go. Here's General Kitchener in his favourite pose, pointing at you, saying, come on, Britain needs you. And this, this wasn't the only poster. In fact, they hardly used this one. The main way they recruited was in public houses, music halls, market squares, village halls, everywhere they could. They gave out papers, they stood up and talked to recruit the men. And they didn't have much trouble in recruiting them. Bonk. There they are, they're at a long way to Tipperary and off they go, smiles on their faces, people waving them off. And if you look at the faces, you'll probably find a few that you sort of recognise. Um, but they were happy to go because they were feeling gung-ho. As I said, we had the empire behind us. They're, we were the biggest power on the planet at the time. So we didn't. We thought we were completely invincible. So off they went, waved goodbye by the ladies with flowers and um, and um, anything that they could be given, kisses all all, all the way. And um, they <laughs> and they thought, oh, it'll it'll all be over by Christmas. And you remember that? That's a famous one, isn't it? It'll all be over by Christmas. So the first thing the government did once they started recruiting troops was they brought in the defense of the realm act otherwise known as dora and this was uh, effectively military rule censorship key powers british summertime was brought in and you weren't allowed any white flower 
Now, that means because they felt there might be food shortages because we imported a lot of food then. And so you had to use the brown husk and everything. So you could only buy brown bread. And there was no whistling, which I find rather odd. And there was quite a number of other things that went with Dora. And one of them was that you weren't you weren't allowed to melt down gold and silver. Now, I haven't really worked out why you weren't allowed to melt down gold and silver, but hey ho. Um, but you weren't allowed to light bombards or fireworks. Well, that makes perfect sense. You mustn't give bread to horses or chickens. I don't know if any other animals come in there or whether you just gave it to horses or chickens. Anyway, you weren't supposed to do that because of possible food shortages. But the best one of all on Dora, and there are lots, is you mustn't write abroad in invisible ink. Now, I've <laughs> so spies beware. And there actually was a lot of spies, funnily enough. It wasn't the James Bond type. But anyway, so... Here we have Dora, Defence of the Realm. So that gave the government wide reaching powers. It meant that they could do anything they wanted to um, make the war, to, for the war, for the war, yeah. They could do anything they wanted and they didn't have to go through the process of putting it before Parliament and having it debated. So that was what that done. So they're really far reaching powers. Anyway, along they go and in the factories, uh, they, the factories that we have, and I think there was only four or five um, government owned factories at the time producing munitions. So they're doing their best to produce them while all the men that worked in those factories, all the younger men, were trotting off to war, leaving the factories half starved, shall we say. Not starved, but starved. So here we have in 1915. Something terrible has happened here. We have the Shell scandal. The Times reported it on May 27, 1915. And they reported that, that in the trenches, the Germans were sending over seven shells to our one. And bullets were also being rationed to the troops. Now, this was a situation that simply couldn't go on. It was absolutely no good, was it? And when the public found out about this, they really were very angry and there were lots of protests and flag waving and letter writing to the Times, no doubt, about something had to be done about this. So who was left? Well, traditionally in Edwardian times, or perhaps George V here now, isn't it? Um, they, women had certain jobs. It was all class linked, because if you were upper class, you didn't work. Good gracious me, no. If you were middle class, you might be a teacher, a governess or um, a nurse even. That's a possibility, but not much more. There were only certain things that women should do because, after all, they were delicate little people. But working class women, poor working class women, had always worked. And they always worked in factories and in domestic service and so forth and they were always paid a very small amount so now they're faced with this situation where they've got no one to make munitions or very few people to make munitions it was always considered to be a skilled job and men did not want to give up their skilled jobs they didn't want women to find out that they could actually do it and there was um, an act passed later on during the First World War that was added to Dora to say that uh, men were entitled to have their jobs back uh, when they returned from war or if they returned from war. Anyway, let's move along. So here we have the posters to recruit women. And as you can see, there's absolutely no emotional blackmail going on here at all. Suddenly, it's it's OK for women to work. Suddenly, it's all right for them to take men's jobs, because the thing was, if they didn't produce the ammunition, we were certainly going to lose the war. So production was all. And in 1915, as part of Dora, Lloyd George started building factories. And one of the factories he built, I will tell you about in a minute. But as you can see, these were all put out there in, and they did the same thing, musicals, pubs, market squares to recruit women. 
And this was a very popular one, women are doing their bit, because it shows the young woman putting her coat on and Tommy Atkins walking out the door. And she would then be uh, called Tommy Atkins' sister. And the origins of Tommy Atkins, if ever, anybody doesn't know, was the Duke of Wellington. He, um, he commended this young guy on bravery and his name was Tommy Atkins. So the British soldier has been Tommy Atkins ever since. So anyway, these women come on, come and work in the factories. Now, because of the war, the economic situation in Britain was dire and factories were closing all over the place because fancy goods that people normally bought, like buttons and lace and uh, bits and bobs, they were not wanted anymore. And the economic downturn meant that most women were out of work. Most men were across the pond fighting. And so things were very difficult. And there was like something like, um, well, 190,000 women out of, out of work. So down at the labour exchanges, that the only job that they were offering was munitions. So women were put in an awkward position. They hadn't got, they had to, they had to work to earn money, to feed their children, to keep a roof over their head. They didn't know if their husband, sweetheart, brother, father would be killed at any moment. So many of them thought, well, okay, what can I do? Also, many of them would have been excited about it because actually signing on to be a to be a munitions worker meant you were sent away from home. The other issue with that was when you signed on, you got a uniform and you got a number. You were not you were not a person anymore. You were a number. And so they were just like the armed forces in that respect. They weren't people. They were a number. So let's move on to the next one, if I can remember what it was. Right. Yes. OK. So here we go. Now, this is H.M. Gretna. Um, it's it's was the biggest factory in the world when it was built. And it was built by 10,000 navvies, Irish, of course. <laughs> I don't suppose they all were, but it was built by them. And they started it in early 1915 and it was up and firing, making munitions by the autumn. And 12,000 women, it went up to about 30,000 in the end, but 12,000 women were there to start working. Now, this is an aerial view and you can see all the sheds where they made where they made the munitions and also the hostels there. Now, they worked very hard making the factory as efficient and effective as it could be to produce something they called cordite. Now, we call it TNT, really. It's a mixture of um, ammonia nitrate, um, nitrocellulose, which is gun cotton, and nitrate itself. And it's a mixed up and it's a highly volatile material, but it's dried out into cords and then it's fairly safe to ship on. But it was very dangerous. Anyway, they built the factory to make this. They've got all the girls coming in. They've also got a lot of chappies there as well who go to Carlisle for their tea. And um, well, they get together and there's some hoo-ha going on. However, it's not half as bad as it's made out to be. At this point, the women munition workers were called munitionettes. And they, well, they had to wear trousers, which was seen as absolutely outrageous. But these sheds that they work in were mostly open and cold. This site, Gretna, it was nine miles wide by two miles long, and it had 125 miles of railway track on it. And it had roads and two towns, East Rig and Mossban, two towns. One was still in England and one was across the border. And the girls lived on site and they built the hostels. The factory was all built nice and tidy and the hostels themselves were built and they were like, they looked like houses from the outside, ordinary family houses. But inside they were just divided up into little partition areas with a single bed, a chest of drawers and a basin and jug for washing. Now, some of the girls that went there couldn't have been more than more delighted, because if you think back to this time in, in our history, um, mainly people had big families. Mainly they couldn't afford big houses to house their families. And generally speaking, siblings would, would share a bed. 
and a bedroom. There possibly was only two bedrooms anyway. So you know, when they got to find out that they just had their own room, even in domestic service, they, they sometimes shared the beds, but they found they had their own room. So a lot of young girls were very pleased and they were perhaps earning 25p a week in domestic service and 55p a week if they went to do munitions or more if they chose to do the dangerous work. And first of all, the girls that were sent here, and they came from all over Britain, um, a great many of them from Coventry, some from Ireland, and anywhere, basically, they could be sent here, and a lot from, from around Scotland too. And they were mainly single women. This is all that government wanted, single women, 15 to 19. As time went by and conscription came in, they high, they made the, the ages higher and because they had then married women came to work because they simply didn't have enough women to do the work to keep up with the war machine across the pond. So here we have two young women mixing up the devil's porridge. Now, that's the... Um, core diet stuff that I was telling you about, the gun cotton and the nitrocellulose stuff. OK, so this is quite dangerous stuff. Um, if you rubbed it together, that would go poof. But generally speaking, they didn't do that. They mixed this mixture with their bare hands, it seems. And the other thing that <laughs> that um, is a problem with this stuff is it gives off tremendous fumes and it smells awful. But the fumes made the girls feel very sick, gave them very bad headaches. But after a while that wore off and they got headaches and sickness when they didn't work with it. So actually it was quite addictive. And some of the girls would try and take a piece home with them so that they could keep. It was actually sweet to taste too. So some of them would suck the stuff, honestly. And it's got called the devil's porridge when Sir Arthur Conan Doyle visited the factory as a war correspondent, I think this will be before he wrote um, Sherlock Holmes, but anyway, he was a war correspondent and he went and he said of these girls, he said, these young smiling girls mixing up the devil's porridge and they don't realise that a single spark would blow them all to smithereens. So he actually wrote that in the newspaper. I don't know which paper he wrote for, probably the Guardian, but who knows? <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. So these young girls, and they were only young girls first of all they had to wear trousers which was an absolute outrage and secondly they had to all live together um thirdly they weren't allowed to go into carlisle and the the women's police force came about in order to make sure these munitionettes didn't misbehave now after a while working with this stuff their skin would turn yellow not so bad in this um production end it got really bad when it went to the filling end so this cordite was made it was dried into cords and then it was shipped by rail um, by canal and by cart to fill-in factories and there were a number of those in all there were about 250 factories in the first world war that produced munitions and there was also privately run ones that possibly aren't on the record. So let's move on. This is one of the filling factories at Rotherwas near Hereford. Now the government tried to build their new factories in places where there was a lot of mist. Although um, the Air Force wasn't really up to much, the Zeppelins would come over and try and bomb places and they actually bombed Woolwich, but um, not as too seriously but anyway there she is now that's the cordite it's now powder they break it down into powder pour it into these shells and then she has wood detonator in and screw the top down if you don't screw it down enough then it won't go off it'll be a dud if you screw it down a bit too much then you can say good night sweetheart and she was doing this all day long along with thousands of others this will be um um, a publicity photograph I, I expect but certainly that's what she was doing and she's got the tunic and the hat because they needed to cover their hair because after a while 
the hair would change colour. If you were dark, it might go blonde um, just on the outer edges. And if you were dark, it sometimes went orange or, or green even. So funny colours. Um, and this is more rather worse. There you go. A million shells. They actually produced at that factory when it was at full tilt in 1916, 17. They were producing 70,000 to 95,000 shells a week. And the Gretna factory was producing 800 tons of cordite a week when they were at full tilt. It's an incredible amount, an incredible effort by so many women. And as you can see, they're mostly women. The supervisors were men. And there's a young boy there because um, the the idea that children couldn't work sort of went out of the window when the First World War broke out. And there were incidences of children working in all sorts of areas to do with munitions as well as other uh, war related things. So that that is not a computer generated photograph that goes right back into the distance with all the shells, a million shells, incredible amount. I think there was something like uh, three and a half billion shells that went over in the First World War, but who knows? Who knows? So what's my next one? Oh, yes. Here's another fill-in factory. This one was built um, in 19... Uh, yeah, early 1916, I think. And that covered a huge area, huge area in Chilwell, which is just outside Nottingham. And they too built lots they did lots and lots of shells the very big ones there I think these were for the navy I'm not certain anyway these are crane drivers I found out these girls so I don't know they must be driving the crane to pick go down and pick up all the shells so there they are and I call them my high flyers in 1917 and here we are a year later and there was a huge fire and this 800 tons of, of this um, explosive went up in July 1918. So the war was nearly over. What a pity. Anyway, hundreds of people were killed. About 103 people were killed and hundreds more in, injured. And an eyewitness account says that um, the explosions went on for three or four days. and windows were blown out in a like a three mile round area and people came running out of the factory with their clothes on fire with their faces blackened with limbs missing and it was absolutely appalling i will say that unlike rosworth because there were seventeen thousand women working there at chilwell because it was the much bigger bombs it was less women working there there was something like 3,000 working there but many of them were injured in this explosion I could talk to you about plenty of other explosions but I mean it gets a bit un unhappy doesn't it we can't have that so let's have a look at what we've got here this is oh, oh the furnace girls I always find this amazing because not only did the women fill the, the shells with me with them um, cordite and they made the cordite they also made the shell casings and here are a couple of women stoking up the furnaces and in Gretna they ran the power station they ran the waterworks they did everything there that was really almost all women 90 odd percent women and here's the furnace workers which I find great perhaps she got a job on on the uh, on the Cunard line shoveling into the boilers <laughs> after the war because it's weird isn't it now she's doing this job what's she going to go back to being a parlour maid yes it's odd isn't it so and now we have this one these are the Woolwich Arsenal girls so there they are now they uh, this is the point where they become called the canary girls this point because these girls are all making shells and bullets these girls are all going yellow the Rosworth girls of course down down in Hereford and also the Welsh girls in Pembury and Bridge End and that they're all going yellow too so this is the point where it becomes the canary girls where they become the canary girls and that was their that was their title and actually down in um pembry um even the even the rabbit's fur 
<laughs> was going yellow because there was so much of this dust in the air and none of it was good for you. It made you anemic. The girls would lose teeth. They would have skin rashes. They would, well, they ended up with liver, toxic liver disease, a lot of them. Um, and there were various other chemicals um, that were used that they worked with in the dangerous rooms. Um, they would only be allowed to work in those for so long. And uh, cosmetic com companies like, um, believe it or not, Ovaltine used to make cream for them so that they wouldn't get so yellow to look after their skin. And after a while, they gave them milk to drink because they felt that this would help. Um, they had a welfare um, supervisors who would be from the middle classes who would supposedly look after the girls. And actually, they didn't like them, the, the factory girls, because they thought they were being spied on. However, they did like the factory inspectors who would be women from the upper class. But they were allowed to go and complain to them where the welfare officers were trying to keep them out of trouble, so to speak, because I dare say there was uh, fun and games from time to time. Now, they worked all of them 12 hour shifts, 10 hour shifts and later on in the war, eight hours shifts. But to start with, they were 12 hour shifts and sometimes they had to travel for two hours to get to work. Um, so they really worked very hard. And during night shifts, they all used to sing because that was the only way that they could stay awake. So let's see what am I moving on to? Oh, yes. One thing that they did find was women's health improved. Now, their health probably improved despite all the nasty uh, chemicals they were ingesting um, because they were fed regularly because canteens became a thing. The government or the powers that be suddenly realised that they were wasting a lot of time going to and from somewhere to find something to eat. And it was much simpler to feed them on the premises. They realised that they could get more productivity out of people if they were fed on the premises. So all these girls were being fed as well. So they were getting good food and they were and, and they were um, had lots of money which made mentally made them feel better so they found that their health improved so that was one good thing and because of that they also encouraged sports so here we have Barnsley ladies 1917 do you like their football outfits <laughs> you won't see you won't see Liverpool wearing those will you <laughs> but they're so young oh, they're so sweet and so young anyway Barnsley ladies that's them practically every munition factory had a football team and I think suspect other factories did too and here's the one of the famous ones these are Blythe Spartans they are over from the northeast somewhere and this is Bella Ray at 17 years old she scored 133 goals in one season so I suspect there'll be some managers lining up to sign her on now and then we have Dick Kerr's ladies now Dick Kerr's was the big Preston Chorley munitions factory and um, this very famous lady here Lily Parr she was actually six foot two and she was openly gay which I consider very brave of her under the circumstances there wouldn't be many women who'd own up to that in this time in this part of history so these are a bit more cheerful and as I was saying about the canteen well Here's the canteen. This is Lancaster and Morecambe canteen. Now, once again, it's not computer generated. They are all girls there having their tea. <laughs> it's just incredible how many there are. There was a big um, explosion at the White Lun factory where 35 women were killed. And I don't think they opened that again, but I'm not sure. And where did I get to? Ah, right. So we're coming to the end of the First World War now, because that's 1917. And this is this is the picture that I'm going to show you now. It's the picture that touched my heart and made me take on this um, hopeless quest <laughs> to try and get a memorial for the Canary Girls, because there was nearly a million of them in the First World War and the same in the Second World War. And they risked life and limb every day. And I know that's right, because Lloyd George said so.
So here they are. This was a photograph I saw um, on that display in our church to commemorate the end of the First World War. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's interesting. But I've looked at it a lot since. And I, there in the middle of that picture is a girl who looked just like my daughter, my oldest daughter. And down here is a girl who looks just like my granddaughter. And up here is a woman who looks very much like my friend. And I'm sure if you look at this photograph for a while, you'll find faces that you can connect with. And that's what happened to me. And so we've been trying to get a memorial for these girls, but I'll tell you more about that later. So where do we go now? We go to a logo again, because there is a little period here between the wars. The First World War ends. It's the war to end all wars and it's never going to happen again. However, the country is on its knees. Everybody is pretty desperate. There's no work. There's no money. It's a really sad time, a really sad time. And in 1919, a committee was put together by Parliament to look into whether women could actually do jobs the same as a man could do. And their finding was that, yes, women could do that, but they didn't do anything about it. So they could have started paying them equal wages, but they didn't. They just shelved that thing. So also, um, Mari Stokes had her birth control clinic, which would be wonderful um, if you were um, upper and middle class because you could afford to go to such clinics. But it didn't do a great deal for working women, for working class women, that is. And women uh, finally were able to get degrees. And Mari Stokes herself got her doctorate in Munich, which is rather odd, isn't it? But she did because she couldn't get one here. So I think 1927 or something that um, Oxford University allowed women to have degrees. Women could study for a degree, but they couldn't get one. <laughs> they couldn't get one on paper. So, right, so um, now in uh, 1928, look what happens there. Oh, look at that. What's occurring? This woman here is voting. Whoopie doozy. So women finally get the vote in 1928. Having said that, in 1918, they could have the vote, but only if they were over 30 and they owned property which was pretty unusual. There'd be a few, but not, not many. And also in 1918, the ordinary working man got the vote because they didn't have it before. Everyone thinks they did, but they didn't have it before. They had to be um, property owning or rate paying. Now, most working class men did not own property. So the ordinary man in the street probably didn't have a vote until until uh, 1918. They didn't have one before that. But women didn't get theirs till 1928. And then in 1936, oh no, 1930s, Amy Johnson flying to Australia. Isn't that marvellous? And you know, she hadn't had much training at all. She never practiced for it. She just went for it. Quite amazing woman, quite amazing. And she she flew lots of planes in the Second World War, didn't she? And she got lost on the Thames. Uh, she, her plane went down in the Thames and they never did find her, Thames estuary. Right. So, ah, there we are. This is it. The arch traitor, Edward VIII. If anybody would like to argue with me about that, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to argue with you. But if you've seen the few programmes we've seen lately, you'll probably agree with me that he is definitely the arch traitor and a spoiled brat to boot. So we had that and that was quite um, upsetting for the country and the country which is now getting back on its feet and people are finding work and the women of course had to go back to very um, menial jobs although now they be, they could become typists and shop uh, assistants they had more opportunity because of evening classes but um, generally speaking when the chaps came back from the war they took the jobs and if they were disabled in any way they took the jobs that women used to do so the women lost out twice anyway so here we are 1936 and also uh, Oswald Mosley was Mosley was stirring somewhere in the background and 
there were riots, riots in the street because in Germany they had brought in conscription and they were building up their army. So many people in this country were thinking that maybe there was a war on the horizon because somehow or other, um, many people would argue that the First World War was never finished in a sense. So anyway, here we are. Boom. So this is it, September the 3rd, and here we are again at war. This time, because they've tramped all over Poland and not Belgium, but they soon would. So we go down this road again, and I've got to find where I'm up to on my slides. <laughs> Whoops, lost me way. Never mind. Oh, OK, must be here somewhere. Yes, that's it. Right, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Right, so now it's war again. So what happens now? Well, this time... Think about it, it's a much more dangerous war. We've got an army, we've got a proper standing army, which we didn't give up. We've got a very good navy, but we've also got our fledgling air force. And at this point, I don't suppose anyone realised just how important the air force would be in this situation. So now... The government knows, and in fact, Rotherwus in Herefordshire had never been shut down. It had continued to make armaments right through until this point. I think they started in earnest in 1936. So a lot of people were thinking that war was um, inevitable. So here we go. We'll come to the women again, because this time the government knows what's going down. And although in the First World War they shied away from putting anything in the cinemas, because they did have cinemas, silent though they were, these were in the cinemas, especially that one, come to the factories in the beginning of the Second World War, come to the factories. And this one is Rosie the Riveter, the, uh, it's more American, the girl in the blue outfit there, um, and the other one fighting fit for the factories. So they were recruiting women again, and the newspapers were headlining how many women had come to sign up to make munitions and how marvellous it was and so forth and so on. But actually they were fibbing because women weren't very keen on uh, on um, signing up to make munitions because they were all aware of the dangers this time um, most of them because they'd had relatives or um, friends or family friends that had been in munitions they'd also have seen the injuries and we're living in a time, even here at the beginning of the Second World War, we're living in a time where people with injuries or any kind, any kind of disability were considered to be outside society. They didn't bring them in. Someone was blind. They, you know, they were sort of put in a home. <laughs> they weren't, they weren't generally accepted. Fidget, fidget, excuse me. <laughs> My cushions are gone flat. Um, so, so here we are women being recruited again and I think they were much braver now to sign on and of course they did and what there we are this is the train they had to put extra trains on to take the women to Woolwich Arsenal to get going again and all the factories were up and firing pretty quickly except that they'd sold off Gretna there was nothing left there except a few sheds where they stored ammunition. So they built a new factory at Aycliff um, near County Durham, a huge factory there. And once again, it had its own railway lines, its own station, its own power um, supply and so on. And the building of Aycliff is rather amusing because there was a guy called Joseph Kelly, who was a builder, a contractor to build some of the factory. And he managed to sell the plans <laughs> to a German spy for all of 30 quid. <laughs> they didn't hang him either. He got a prison sentence, but there. why he thought he'd get away with that, I have no idea, but it is amusing. He was a bit short of money because he had a wife and four kids, but there you go. Anyway, so there they all go to Woolwich again. And Woolwich, of course, had been producing arms all the time. In fact, it's been producing arms for centuries, hasn't it? So here we have the Aycliffe factory. 
That's the site at Cowardly Durham. Now, if you remember the one we had uh, about Gretna, you could see all the sheds. You could see it everywhere. Now, this one, because we have um, the Nazis also have an air force, so we have to be a bit more careful. So each shed is enclosed be beside grassy mounds. That's if the shed blows up, then it doesn't affect any other sheds and production can go on. Once again, production is all. And many accidents happen. And when they do, because you've only got to drop a little detonator and poof, you know. Um, and they, when they did, they cleared them up as quickly as possible. The newspapers weren't allowed to report deaths until later on. So everything was kept under wraps. And the women who worked in munitions in the Second World War, it was a long time before they were given a badge to say they were on war work. And so they were looked upon as, as dragging their feet, so to speak, as the war wore on once we got to 1941. So that's a cliff. And here's Phoebe Moreland. She's an Acliff Angel. Now they came to be called Acliff Angels because Lord Haw Haw used to do that. He used to go, Oh, you women working there, we know where you are. We're going to bomb you, and you'll all be Acliff Angels. Well, here's a real one, bless her. Phoebe Moreland, and she was killed in the explosion in 1942, along with five or six other women. And this, look, it brings it home to you because there's the little children there and her husband. Very sad. Um, many women lost their arms, their sights, they were their fingers um, and often, often were scarred badly from the acid stuff that they worked with. And these are the Swinnerton roses. Now, this Swinnerton, I think, is somewhere in Staffordshire. I'm not sure. I can't remember. They have a rose named after them now. Um, and they are working with very dangerous chemicals. They are um, experimenting with different things. And they had a lot of danger rooms there. So you could earn a great deal of money, but you certainly put your health at serious risk. But um, they have a commemorative um, thing there, as they do, as they do at Chilwell, they have a commemorate uh, memorial thing for all the people who died there. But these women, I need to find out more about. In fact, this is such a huge subject that it's going to take me till the day I die to get a handle on it. I think there is just so much to learn about it. And it's so interesting. And these, they were so brave to do what they did because they actually knew what might happen to them. They weren't as um, naive, shall we say, as the, the women in the First World War, not that they were particularly naive. Right, so there's the Swinnerton Roses. And here we are, Kirby, Liverpool. Now you all know this place. These young women work in the offices. They don't work on the factory floor. This is a, um, a publicity photograph to come and work at the factories and make the shells and the bombs and these nice young women all worked in the offices and I was I was doing a presentation out somewhere on the coast here of Cumbria and a woman in the audience stood up and went that's my mother and she never knew she never knew <laughs> she knew her mum had worked in the factory um, offices in the war but she'd never seen her do it and there she is that woman there with a smile on her face <laughs> so that was quite a moment I keep trying to get in touch with her to send her the photograph, but um, the email address I've been given isn't right and it won't go through. So it's a bit of a bore. But anyway, I'll work on that. So there they are in Liverpool, which is great. Now, this one is quite one that's important to me. This is the Chorley factory. Remember, it was Dick Kerr's before. Now it's the Chorley factory um, at Exton. And this was one of the biggest ones in the country, a fill-in factory. Lots of factories um, had um, TNT uh, making areas on site. They didn't ship it all around the country like they did in the First World War. So here they are making quite large shells there. And they would definitely be yellow, these girls. And actually, um, we have a, a supporter in a chap called Eric Martlew, who used to be MP for Carlisle. And he's very fond of our Canary Girls. And he helps me out with this campaign because his mother worked at Exton at Chorley and lost half of her hand. 
when she dropped the detonator in the detonator tray and off it went, blew off half her hand. And she was lucky because there happened to be a surgeon visiting the factory at the time and he was able to take her away and do his best to rebuild her hand but Eric said he's always felt terrible about the fact that he used to keep going oh I don't want to hold that hand mummy I don't want to hold that hand Ooh. you know as children would so that's that's one of the bigger factories in the second world war now this one I don't know if it's going to come over Mike will know is that this one is, is Nancy who worked at Rotherworth in the second world war and she's going to talk to you will that work do you think anyway i'll try it I'm hoping you can all hear and see it. No? And there are subtitles, Sandra, so we're all right, but we can't hear her. That was Nancy, and it's quite something, isn't it, to find that she she escaped that. And I just think that these women need to have um, parity of equality with all the chaps in the National Arboretum. Now, this is something that was in the British Legion magazine a couple of weeks ago, and it's actually um, a memorial, and it's actually in um, Hyde Park or St James's Park, that area. And it's for um, animals in the First World War. And it cost about 11 million pounds, so I'm told, by a, a good source. But it says animals deserve to be remembered too. And I do agree. I think it was appalling what, what was done to the animals in the First World War. However, I also think that um, two million women should be remembered too. So here's the Arboretum, beautiful place. I don't know how many of you have been. It's wonderful. I loved every minute of it. And this particular memorial is central and it is inside it. It is to the um, casualties, the dead of the wars since the Second World War. And of course, it includes women in that. And it's really um, rather touching, women soldiers, that is. Um, so this is where we want our memorial and we're working with the Arboretum. We know we can have one there. The only issues that are holding us back is either one, we have to be um, a registered charity or two, we have to be supported by a nationally recognised organisation. Now, we've tried twice to become a registered charity and we're trying to work on a third go. But it's very, very difficult because we are not helping anybody. We're not helping, say, a one legged chappy called Fred. We get it then. But what we're trying to do is to um, get the history, social history of these women and the, the sacrifices they made to the general public to see. So apparently that doesn't actually come under their headings of a charitable um um, what would you say, a charitable thingy? I don't know. I can't find the right word at the moment. Um, words often slip away from me. I don't know if you have those uh, moments too. Um, but yes, we don't come under the charitable banner. Um, so we've got to look for a national organisation. Now, the um, Land Army, Women's Land Army and the Timber Jills, they were backed by the National Federation of Farmers Union, weren't they? So they got there. So they have one. And there was only 23,000 of them in the First World War. 
and 240,000 in the Second World War. And I think the most dangerous thing that they faced was getting pregnant by one of the farmhands. But there you go. <laughs> but I, I really think these women deserve to be recognised. And so we have an architect as one of our trustees. And this is the uh, memorial she has designed. You might recognise the girl there. She was on the Rotherworth picture. And um, that would be made of bronze wire, which turns sort of grey colour eventually. And all the materials have to be porous. Um, I'm, I mean, I've spoken, I've spoken with, I've met with Andy Astle from the Arboretum. There's nothing to stop us except we have to have this backing. We're raising the mummy, you know, but we can't, we can't do anything more. Um, so apparently. Um, if you know Banbury, you know the, the nursery rhyme. Uh, there was a, a lady rode on a white horse, bells on her fingers and rings on her toes or something. Yeah, you know that? Well, a group at Banbury got charitable status to have that statue, to raise money for that statue. They managed to get charitable status. But what I found out was they actually took the charity commission to court. So I was flabbergasted at that to get that. So I don't know. I just don't know what we can do. If there is anybody out there who knows how to get past the charitable people, please help. <laughs> please help. Because we can't move forward. Although the money's going up all the time. But um, yeah, this is the way I earn money for, towards our memorial. But anyway, thank you very much. I've come, I've run out of steam. Um, if there's anything you want to know, please ask.